Now, you've probably seen these core principles before, and they're extremely important, and that's why they're always the first little bit of information that comes up in any review textbook or question bank when you're learning ethics. The four core principles of ethics are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And we're going to go through each of these one at a time, and I'll use some examples of challenging scenarios or questions that you might see about these core principles. And if we can just pause for one second, as a bigger theme of ethics, what you'll notice is that the material itself isn't that hard to learn, right? There's very finite amount of information when it comes to learning ethics. But what's really challenging is applying those, you know, the theory of ethics and what we should be doing to actual questions. Because oftentimes with ethical questions, there'll be a couple answers that sound really good and really convincing. And it will be very, very difficult to choose between them. So as we go through these examples and as we go through this entire Dirty Ethics series, I'll do my best to point out what you should keep in mind when you're answering questions. So let's get started with the four ethical principles. The first one is autonomy. So autonomy refers to respecting patients as individuals, right? So you respect each patient as their own individual. It requires that you create an environment that's conducive to informed consent. And you're going to see the word informed consent pop up a lot in this lecture. And it's actually going to be the second video in Dirty Ethics. So see the next video in this lesson series to get more information about informed consent. Autonomy also it refers to honoring patient decision making regardless of what their choice is, assuming that this choice is uh, made with capacity. And we'll get into what capacity is in a future video as well. So that's autonomy. Now, if you're confused about what autonomy means and you're not really good at understanding it by referring to these bullet points, look at the word itself. Auto means self, right? Automatic driving car is a self-driving car, right? Auto digestion is self-digestion. So look at the prefix of these words if you're having trouble remembering what the ethical principle refers to. So it means self. And again, autonomy is respecting patients as individuals or respecting them as their individual selves. So very, very important. The next ethical principle is beneficence. And this is acting in the patient's best interests. And on exams, this usually conflicts with the principle of autonomy. And that's the reason that ethical questions about beneficence are actually pretty challenging. So we're going to focus on this point in red, that on exams, beneficence usually conflicts with the principle of autonomy. So I wanna use an example to show you how this might come up. So here's our example. A 39-year-old white male with a past medical history of renal cell carcinoma, currently stage one, is seen in the oncology office. He says that he does not want to engage in cancer-suppressing therapy and does not wanna hear about chemotherapy or radiation or resection. He is content to die. The patient is judged to have full capacity in making this decision. Which of the following is the best response? So before I even read the different answer choices here, let's just really quickly highlight what this question is saying. So we've got a guy who has a cancer in his kidney. It's currently stage one. He's not interested in hearing about treatment options, and he's very much willing to die. At some point, it looks like the physician who's you know, explaining everything to him, judge this patient to have full capacity in making this decision. So now the question is, which of the following is the best response? A, I respect your decision, but tell me how you arrived at this decision. B, I respect your decision, but medically, there's hope to treat this. C, I respect your decision, but it is my obligation to tell you that this is not the best course of action. D, we will not proceed with any further treatment. E, I will be forced to discuss your choice with the ethics committee. Now, a lot of these answers seem pretty good, right? I mean, if you're, if you're the physician in real life, you might say a combination of these things, but on a test, there's one answer, okay? There's one answer. Now, I know what a lot of you are, are leaning towards right now. You're probably leaning towards choice A, but this is not the correct answer because in the question, the patient was already judged to have full capacity. And we're going to get into capacity in a future video, but as one of the criteria of capacity, the patient has to explain to you in a seemingly logical and linear fashion how they arrived at their decision. So A would be redundant because they've already told you how they have arrived at that decision since you judge them to have capacity. So the correct answer here is actually C. And if you 
if you read C, it says, I respect your decision, but it's my obligation to tell you that this is not the best course of action. So obviously the question was hinting that this is stage one, it's treatable, but the patient simply doesn't want to hear any treatment options. Okay, so you as the physician have the obligation to act in the patient's best interest, which is the principle of beneficence in telling them that I respect your decision, right? You're respecting their autonomy, but it's your obligation to tell them that this is not the best course of action. So while you're respecting them because of the principle of autonomy and letting them act as a self, you also have to maintain the principle of beneficence and act in their best interest by telling them that this is not the best course of action. The reason that B is not the correct answer is because you never want to give somebody hope that something is going to be treated or cured. You can say that, you know, you can cite data and say what the treatment outcomes are and what the prognosis is, but a general statement such as, but medically there's hope to treat this, general statements like that are never going to be the right answer on ethics questions. So avoid those generalities. D, we will not proceed with any further treatment. Technically, that's right because the patient has capacity and you know, you're going to respect their decision because you're going to respect their autonomy, but you have to throw in this little qualifier that it's your obligation to tell them that it's not the best course of action. Because if you just say, we will not proceed with any further treatment, then you're kind of like lacking beneficence a little bit because by you're not acting in the patient's best interest. If you don't tell them that this, this is not the best course of action, you have that obligation. And then E, I will be forced to discuss your choice with the ethics committee. Anytime you see ethics committee, it's probably not the right answer. It's only the right answer in one very unique case, which we'll get into in a future video. But again, the gist of this question is that oftentimes beneficence, which is acting in the patient's best interest, is going to be at odds with autonomy, where you're allowing the patient to make their own decisions, because oftentimes they're going to make decisions that are not in their best interest. So again, the only point of this question was to show you that beneficence and autonomy are oftentimes on exams going to be at odds with one another. The next ethical principle is non-maleficence. Non-maleficence refers to the do no harm thing, you know, the oath that you swore in medical school, do no harm. Non-maleficence requires careful consideration of risks versus benefits. It demands informed consent be given to a patient if a risky procedure is attempted. Now, let's look at the word, right? Non means no and maleficence means like evil or bad or, you know, terrible. So non-maleficence literally means no bad. So this is do no harm or do no bad. Let's look at a practice question that's going to highlight what um, non-maleficence is oftentimes juggled against. So here's our example. A 56-year-old Hispanic female is found to have elevated LFTs on routine screening. She is recommended to undergo a liver biopsy. As part of the informed consent process, she has explained all of the pertinent information. The explanation of risks versus benefits in this situation is carefully balancing which ethical principles? A, non-maleficence versus autonomy. B, non-maleficence versus beneficence. C, non-maleficence versus justice. D, non-maleficence versus both beneficence and autonomy. Or E, non-maleficence versus both beneficence and justice. So the answer here is B. It's non-maleficence versus beneficence. So here's, here's what's going on. When you Non-maleficence means do no harm. So whenever you're going to do some risky procedure or some invasive test, you have to weigh the risks versus benefits, right? The risk of doing harm against the benefit of that treatment or that invasive procedure doing something beneficial for the patient. So acting in the patient's best interest and allowing them to confer benefits is beneficence. But non-maleficence and your desire to do no harm is worrying about the risks and explaining that in the informed consent process. So oftentimes on exams, you're going to have to balance non-maleficence or do no harm against beneficence and acting in the patient's best interest, right? It's deciding when is something medically necessary, even if there is a risk of harming the patient in doing so. So oftentimes this is the dilemma that you're going to see on exams. So keep this in mind. Our fourth and final core ethical principle is justice. And simply put, justice is treating people fairly. Now, there's one minor little uh, stipulation that we have to make about justice. And I'm going to use a practice question to illustrate it to you. And hopefully you never forget it after this. So a 28-year-old black male with a past medical history of GERD is seen in the ED waiting room complaining of bloating and gas. He's concerned that he has a bowel obstruction. He's triaged by the ED staff, and he waits in the waiting room for the next three and a half hours. As he's sitting there, he sees other patients who arrived after him coming in and going straight back into the emergency room. 
in this situation, is the ethical principle of justice being upheld and being served for this patient who's forced to wait in the waiting room while he watches other patients go straight back? A, no, this patient's treatment is not equal. B, no, this, treatment, this patient's treatment is not equitable. C, yes, triage is an exception to justice. D, yes, this patient's treatment is equal. E, yes, this, treatment, this patient's treatment is equitable. So obviously, as you can see here, I'm being a little nitpicky, but I wanna use this to illustrate a very important point. So the answer here is E. Yes, justice is being served, and the reason that it's being served is that pa this patient's treatment is equitable. So justice requires equitable treatment, not equal treatment. So equitable means like you're offered the same thing under the law, right? You're offered the same opportunity within the constraints of the medical legal system. So when triage is, is the situation, it's the hospital's duty to take patients back to the emergency department that have more acute complaints, right? Chest pain, ruling out MIs, pneumothorax, things that are acutely life-threatening. And in that triage process, everybody has equitable treatment because when this gentleman came into the room, he was also triaged and he was given that equitable treatment. And if it was something theoretically that was life-threatening, he would have been taken right back. But he didn't because he's got to sit and wait for a bed because those beds that are open have to go to the acutely life-threatening situations. Now, this is called equitable treatment because it's equitable under the medical legal system. It doesn't necessarily have to be equal because in this case, it's not in, in this situation, it's not equal, right? He didn't go back, but the other patient did. So that is not equal. That is unequal. But justice doesn't require equality. It requires equitability. And C is not correct because triage is not an exception to justice. Justice is still being served here. They're, they're still treating people equitably. So justice requires equitable treatment, not equal treatment. Very, very important to understand that distinction. So that is the end of the first lesson in dirty ethics. As a quick summary, we went over the four core ethical principles, including autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. We used some practice questions as we went through to illustrate some high yield principles and see the rest of this lecture series for more information about ethics.